So um, it's my pleasure and honor to um, be hosting you this evening, along with um, Professor Nicola West, EFP Secretary General. Secretary General. And a particular um, thanks to Sharon Jondra for her um, tremendous work in the background, uh, and to Candice Gasparin also for supporting us. Um, the presentation of the report will begin uh, very shortly. Um, it's a really important report and we're grateful you've been able to join us from all over the world uh, and we look forward to um, a discussion in due course. Um, if I could have the next slide please, Candice. So our panellists today um, are Chrissy Bishop, who uh, is from the Economist Intelligence Unit and really led on the, the project for the Economist Intelligence Unit um, and did a fantastic job on the literature researching and the, uh, and the writing. And we're going to be hearing from Chrissy shortly, who will give the presentation. Uh, David Tordra also from Triangulate uh, Health Limited. David did all the incredibly complex uh, economic modelling, which is made uh, particularly difficult when the data that you have is limited in nature. Um, but that will be explained throughout the presentation. And I think you know uh, Professor West uh, and, and, and myself. So next slide, please. Uh, just some housekeeping to start off with. Um, if everybody could turn off their microphones during the presentation. Um, I'm seeing lots of cameras. It's lovely to see, see people like Lior and uh, Ken Eaton and uh, Christoph Ramsayer. So welcome everybody. Um, so if microphones could be turned off during the presentation and also during the Q&A. Um, if you could ask questions um, during the uh, using the chat facility, you can do that throughout. And then during the question and answer session, uh, if you have any questions and would like to use your microphone, then please just lift your hand electronically. We'll try and identify you uh, and you can turn your microphone on and ask your question. Um, it'd be great if before you start to speak, you could just uh, pronounce your name for us and the institution that you belong to. Next slide. Thank you. So um, the rationale for this uh, significant piece of work really um, was multifactorial, but it was largely based on the fact that a lot of data has emerged from a number of uh, really important global studies, particularly the global burden of disease studies, um, to, to demonstrate the prevalence of periodontitis being significantly high. And of course, it's largely unchanged in the last 15 years or so. Um, we know from the Little paper that looked at the economic impact of periodontitis on the global economy that it does appear to be significant. And then also adding to that from the, the Lancet paper, uh, the, um, the data on years uh, lived with disability and periodontitis and oral diseases in general are very, very high in that list. Some of you may remember the, the green paper that Soren Jepsen and Maurizio Tonetti uh, published a few years ago that started to sort of raise this important issue about the global burden. And so that was the reason that we decided it was time to look at the societal impact uh, of parentitis and ah. to undertake this, this particular model. É, que a Miriam participou, aí veio a Dani, vamos lá, vamos, vamos para o challenge, vamos lá, vamos lá, vamos lá. Thank you. Beata for turning off your microphone, but uh, nice to hear from you. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Um, so it was important we felt strategically that the EFP raised public awareness. This is part of the EFP's strategic plan uh, and has been for a number of years. Um, it's also uh, an important aspect of the EFP plan to start to educate and influence health policy makers and also uh, to improve and promote periodontal health uh, globally. Next slide, please. So the guiding principles here really were um, the independence of the EIU. This was a piece of work they really had to do on their own uh, without influence. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't have any particular uh, standing. Um, there, were, there was tremendous support from the EFP um, and there were one or two FP officers in particular uh, who were tasked with providing um, additional literature and context only uh, to Chrissy and her team to make sure that their, uh, that their, their, their literature search and their modelling was appropriate. Um, there was a need uh, to model uh, 
in a very careful way that accommodated what was essentially a paucity of data. Um, and that lack of data was accommodated by involving experts from uh, a number of countries, both technical experts, and I should show you that panel, but also um, subject experts, uh, and also from the public health sector to advise. Um, the national experts provided a national picture and also costs, um, and the various health authorities were contacted for additional data where that was necessary. Um, the modelling was limited to the six larger European economies, uh, as you will hear, purely and simply because that's where the best data uh, could be obtained. Next slide, please. So the timelines were um, following sign off uh, by the EFP um, and the, that followed discussions with uh, the EFP president, Leo Shapira, who's with us today, and the EFP executive um, who was signed up to this. Following that sign off, uh, the literature review started and the EIU undertook that literature review. And as I've mentioned, the EFP leads provided some supplemental literature uh, to Chris for that process. Then the IU collated the policy evidence uh, and uh, David started to develop a model that was based on the steps of care from the treatment guidelines and looked at various different outcome scenarios, which Chrissy will explain. Um, the EFP leads then provided the name of global experts to the IU um, based on subject, country location and, and technical expertise and then the EIU chose from that list who they would contact to maintain the independence. The EIU then conducted a series of individual interviews with individual experts in areas of need and also uh, held an expert panel meeting um, to supplement that process. The model was then finalised by David and his team um, and it was presented to the various panel members and feedback was provided and then the model was essentially run. Once the model was run, again, feedback was provided, the paper was drafted, and that paper was then checked by the experts involved in the process, and um, that was critical really prior to final publication. Next slide, please. So um, particular thanks to uh, a number of ex country experts who I have listed here, uh, Philippe Bouchard, uh, Thomas Cocker, Maurizio Tonetti, Bruno Loss, uh, Mariano Sanz and Ian Needleman. Then from the technical side of things, uh, Wagner Marcel is from the Global Burden of Disease Group, um, Stefan Lissel on economics, Panos Papapanu on the, uh, the epidemiological aspects, and Nigel Carter uh, representing the public interests and also uh, a patient perspective. And then there were fairly lengthy individual interviews held with uh, Wagner Marcenis and also Pier Paolo or Sandro, as we prefer to call him, Cortellini, uh, with Maurizio, with uh, uh, Nicola, Nigel, and uh, also myself. And then the final click. This was the panel uh, that met. Um, yeah. Nicola, West, and I uh, were observers only to that panel. We did not get involved in the discussions. So the discussions were really with the other people uh, listed here. So that's the process. I'm now going to pass you over to Nicola who will say a few words um, uh, about our sponsors uh, to finish off the context. Thank you, Ian. Um, as Secretary General of the European Federation of Periodontology, I have to say I'm delighted to be associated with delivering this white paper on the societal and economic impact of periodontitis, which has recently been published by the, um, the EIU. The report, as Ian said, was commissioned by the Executive Committee of the EFP to strategically evaluate and disseminate the economic cost of periodontal diseases, as well as indicating the underlying values of treatment. And the rationale for commissioning this paper is, it was prompted um, by our improved understanding of periodontal diseases together with their physical, physiological and psychological impacts at the personal and professional and population level. However, key aspects related to the economic impact of periodontal diseases together with the associated financial implications are not so well appreciated. 
and the EFP considered this a, a really a unique opportunity um, to deliver on our strategic plan, which supports the vision of periodontal health for a better life. So the EIU were selected by the EFP for their preeminence in the field of economics. We really needed world leading experts in health economic modeling due to the complexity of this task that's to be undertaken. And the remit provided to the EIU was to produce an independent report aimed at the general public, policymakers, stakeholders and commissioning bodies at national and international level that examines for the first time the societal and economic impact of periodontitis. Now, clearly, this commission carries a significant financial burden that the EFP was unwilling to shoulder completely. And in this regard, the executive committee of the EFP are particularly grateful for the unconditional sponsorship that was provided by Oral-B that enabled the commission to be fulfilled. I would like to specifically thank The Economist for engaging so professionally with the EFP to facilitate this paper, completely fulfilling our remit, and delivering an impartial and accurate paper which presents meaningful and significant economic insight into the societal and financial impacts of periodontal diseases. Thank you very much, Nicola. I, I think I would echo, because many of us on this call are obviously diehard scientists, and this is clearly not a scientific exercise. Uh -huh. It is very much um, a health economic modelling exercise and a really complex one. And that's really why we needed uh, Chrissy and David and the team. Um, if you want something doing properly, you go to the global experts and, and, and let them do it and provide the context. So I think that's really, really important to understand. So um, the way this is going to work is that uh, Chrissy is with us, as is David, and Chrissy is going to essentially um, present to you, we've pre-recorded the presentation just in case there were any glitches, but I can assure you she is here uh, and will be also joining in uh, the Q&A session um, at the end. So uh, Candice, could we, uh, could we play the presentation please? Okay, I think we can start. So my name is Chrissy Bishop, and I was the project manager for this research on the societal and economic impact of periodontitis. And this research was conducted by the Economist Intelligence Unit alongside the European Federation of Periodontology and was sponsored by Oral-B. And what I'm gonna to do today is walk you through some of the main methods that we use for this project and the key findings overall. The results of this study are already published and available online. Uh, I'm sure many of you have already looked at and read the white paper. Uh, but today I'm going to talk you through in a little more detail how we came up with the inputs and results for our economic model. And also we're going to have some time for questions at the end. OK, so the overall objectives and solution. So the European Federation of Periodontology sought to raise awareness on periodontitis and drive policy and behaviour change on gum health. They also wanted to develop new ways of thinking around gum health to drive engagement, as well as increase commitment and action at European level. Ultimately, the aim was to improve patient outcomes. The EIU solution was to conduct an economic model which captures the socioeconomic burden of periodontitis and assesses the evidence linking better periodontal health to better overall health in six European countries. One of the main reasons why the Economist Intelligence Unit thought that this was such an important topic to conduct research on was because periodontitis is the sixth most prevalent health condition globally and affects around 743 million people. And when you list the prevalence of periodontitis against uh, common uh, non-communicable diseases such as cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. Severe periodontitis actually sits above those, and I don't think that that's as uh, commonly known as periodontitis uh, experts might think, because as a public health expert, this might come as a general shock. So we saw um, quite a significant reason to study this in more detail, just from looking at the epidemiology data. It also has a huge impact on society and individuals. 
It's responsible for more years lost to disability than any other human disease. Uh, it's a threat to general health because it has an association with diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. It's also the third most costly disease at around 90 billion euros per year behind diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. It's also a social disease. Periodontitis prevalence is clustered amongst socioeconomically deprived groups across Europe. And the mouth is a marker of people's social position and future disease risk. And although in this presentation, I'm going to talk primarily about the modeling results, we also have a section in the white paper which discusses the importance of integrated general and dental uh, health pathways to assess future disease risk. And also makes, it also makes reference to the need to better access dental care in lower socioeconomic groups. Uh, and despite these sort of morbid statistics, periodontitis is treatable and preventable, and around 95% of cases can be diagnosed and managed by a primary care uh, general dental practitioner. Despite improvements in the quality of oral health services uh, in Europe and increased awareness of the importance of oral hygiene, the prevalence of periodontitis has remained fairly stable over a 20 year period. And here we've plotted data from the global burden of disease. And you can see over that 20 year time period that there's been very little decline in periodontitis in the six countries that we're looking at. So to address uh, this research question, the Economist Intelligence Unit conducted the research in four phases. The first phase was uh, a thorough literature review to evaluate the prevalence and burden of periodontitis and also to review clinical pathways and the current policy documents that are shaping uh, the prevention of perio. The second phase was to conduct an expert panel, which aimed to drive dialogue and understanding on critical issues for policy change to help prevent poor oral health. The third phase was to conduct a quantitative analysis that assesses the health and indirect economic costs associated with periodontitis for each country in the study. And the, the final phase was to summarise the findings of one to three in a white paper. So the cost effectiveness analysis that we conducted, I'm going to go into a bit more detail around that. So cost effectiveness analyses are a way to examine both the costs and health outcomes of one or more disease interventions. They also capture the scale of a problem in tangible quantitative terms and illuminate the aggregate burden of illness on society and the value of evidence-driven intervention. And during our literature review phase, we found very, very few studies that looked into the cost effectiveness of periodontitis. And those that did uh, often were from single centers or studies not Europe-wide, making it difficult to generalise the data to Europe-wide studies. And because of this paucity of evidence, uh, the EIU decided to develop this model that assesses periodontitis costs and health outcomes across six European countries. And those countries were France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain and the UK. The primary objective of the modelling was to determine the return on investment of periodontitis treatment, but also the management of gingivitis, recognising that the prevention and management of gingivitis is essential to the prevention of periodontitis. So before actually constructing the model and uh, coming up with our results, we had to develop this pathway of care which was the skeleton of the modeling process. And it helped us understand how patients move through the steps of treatment. Uh, we used the official European treatment guidelines for periodontitis, which split, splits the treatment into four steps, which we've listed out there. There's also two intervention points, which were prevention and management, which you can see there with the red arrows. If step one treatment for prevention is achieved, the patient can move to either healthy or gingivitis or back to healthy. However, if prevention is not successful and perio is diagnosed, the next intervention point is management. 
as once a perio patient is diagnosed, they remain one for life. Dependent on the severity of the diagnosis, the treatment steps include either step one, behavior change, opt optimal oral hygiene and risk factor control, step two, reducing the accumulation of plaque and calculus, step three, moving to surgery if step two has been unsuccessful, and step four, which involves maintaining periodontal stability by combining therapeutic and preventative methods. And although I'm sure most of you on the call are, are aware of these treatment steps, we use this treatment pathway as a basis for how patients move through our model. And we also associated costs with each of these intervention points and steps of treatment. In the top right hand corner of this slide, you'll see the different types of costs that we, uh, that we estimated in the model. These were the direct costs which were associated with the dental treatments, such as the dental treatments in steps one to four. Uh, we also looked at indirect costs associated with losses to the economy due to absence from work and intangible costs, also losses to the economy associated with uh, experiencing pain, speech difficulties, low self-confidence, uh, problems of expressing emotions, all, a result, all as, a, as a result of uh, poor dental health. We then modelled these costs um, across several different scenarios in order to, to determine the impact of increasing or de decreasing treatments on the costs. The scenarios that we looked at were a business as usual scenario. We then uh, reduced the management of gingivitis to 10% to see what effect that would have on the healthy life years and costs. Then we looked at um, increasing gingivitis management so that it was eliminated. We reduced periodontitis management to envisage no periodontitis management at all. And then the final scenario, we uh, increased periodontitis management to 90%. Just a couple more slides on modelling methods, then uh, we'll move on to the results. So to estimate the monetary value of improved perio care, as well as the population size, the monetary value um, was determined using a willingness to pay approach. This means that each healthy life year gained from managed perio or gingivitis was monetized as 2.5 times the national gross domestic product per capita. Only people with stage two perio were modelled in the study, which is defined as moderate disease. And this is because we estimated using the literature and clinical uh, opinion that around 80% of people with perio sit in this category. So we were capturing most of the population. We also assumed that no one under the age of 35 would be diagnosed with periodontitis. We also assumed that approximately 50% of the population that require treatment do not access dental care. The epidemiology data that we could accrue from the evidence is listed in table one. And we used a combination of the uh, severe periodontitis estimates from the global burden of disease and the estimates for all perio uh, from a separate paper by Cocker et al. And then worked out with a further assumption that 10% uh, of the perio population are mild and 10% are severe. So work out how many people were sitting actually in uh, stage two. Uh, there's more information on how that's calculated in the white paper. We estimate the impact of each scenario on the following outcomes, the total healthy life years gained, the total costs in euros, the cost per healthy life year, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, and the return on investment. What I'm showing you here is a snapshot from the infographic that is also published alongside this report. And it's a top level view of the results uh, and costs per country for three scenarios specifically, the business as usual approach and the two intervention scenarios uh, which are the eliminating gingivitis and managed perio. What you see here on the slide now is the costs for business, the business as usual approach. When I move in the elimination of gingivitis scenario, 
you can see that the costs significantly uh, reduce by about 10 billion in most countries, slightly more in Italy and the UK. When you move in the managed periodontitis scenario, so increasing the management to 90%, the costs uh, increase, but there is still a positive return on investment, which I'm gonna go into in the next slides. So here we have all of the results of each scenario by country. And if you look uh, along the bottom, you see the scenarios, S1, scenario one, which is business as usual. So you can see how much each scenario costs in comparison to that baseline or business as usual approach. In all countries, there's a similar pattern where reducing the management of gingivitis from 95% to 10% is more costly than baseline. So that's scenario two apart from in Germany, where it costs slightly reduce. So there's a message there that, that failing to manage gingivitis can actually lead to more costly treatments. In scenario three, which is eliminating gingivitis, uh, this actually costs less than baseline in all countries. Scenario four, which is no management of perio, this costs the least compared to baseline of all scenarios, but when you increase the treatment to 90% of all those diagnosed, the costs are high in every country, and this might seem shocking at first, but for those scenarios which uh, require a little more upfront investment, there's actually a positive uh, return on investment. So on this slide, what I've plotted here is just the return on investment results for the two intervention scenarios, which are the elimination of gingivitis and 90% of perio patients diagnosed and managed. The elimination of gingivitis has a pretty strong uh, return on investment in all countries, and the 90% perio diagnosed and managed also has a positive return on investment. Although it's not as strong as the gingivitis scenario, there's a positive return on investment nonetheless. Here I've plotted the healthy life years for each scenario by order of magnitude rather than scenario. And for each country, scenarios three and five, again, which are those intervention scenarios, eliminating gingivitis and 90% periodontitis diagnosed and managed, have the highest healthy life years of all scenarios. And reducing gingivitis management and no perio management have the worst uh, healthy life years. So what I'm going to talk through now are the key takeaways from this research as a whole. So combining the findings from the literature and policy review with our cost effectiveness uh, results. So firstly, prevention, diagnosis and management of periodontitis is cost effective. And our economic analysis has shown that both eliminating gingivitis, the precursor to perio, and increasing the rate of diagnosis and management to 90% has a positive return on investment in all the countries that we included in this study. Making efforts to eliminate gingivitis, uh, thus preventing progression to periodontitis, would save considerable costs over a 10 year time period compared with the business as usual approach. Neglecting to manage gingivitis can significantly increase costs and also reduce healthy life years. Therefore, an emphasis on self care and prevention is critical from both an individual and a societal perspective. Although I haven't gone through this section of the report in detail in these slides, the results of our literature and policy review, as well as interviews with uh, dentists, gave us the uh, idea that better integration of dental and general health is, is greatly needed. In the literature, uh, these pathways seem to be developing still, but being able to share information across disciplines may have benefits for both patient care due to uh, periodontitis sharing common risk factors with many other chronic diseases, but also it could, significant, it could significantly contribute to uh, dental and general health research. Integration may also encourage shared responsibility across healthcare disciplines to address unmet oral health needs in vulnerable and marginalized communities. 
Uh, a synergy of societal and individual public health campaigns are also needed. One without the other would exacerbate uh, oral health inequalities. Societal level prevention is of crucial concern to the prevention of periodontitis, especially as it's a disease with highly prevalent, which is highly prevalent in deprived areas. We see this both within and across countries. Interventions to promote better periodontal health need to be embedded into community settings, such as schools for the prevention of caries and community centres for the prevention of uh, gum disease. Dental care needs to be more affordable to the public. The cost of accessing a dentist is quite a significant barrier to receiving treatment uh, early for many. Dental care often appears free on paper, and this is something that we uh, were quite shocked to find whilst we were looking through dental tariffs, is that in countries such as the UK and France, only part of dental procedures for treating perio are actually covered, and the remainder pays out of pocket, is paid out of pocket. And in countries such as Italy and Spain, most or all of the fees for perio are paid for out of pocket. Periodontitis treatment for a low-income family, therefore, is rendered almost unaffordable. Uh, in, in this study, we've provided the evidence that professionally managed perio is in fact cost-effective and therefore publicly covered dental care for periodontitis deserves a review from policymakers and commissioners Europe-wide. Some final um, lessons learned and opportunities. Although I've touched on this throughout the presentation, the data uh, that was available, both for epidemiology estimates of periodontitis and uh, dental tariffs, were very difficult to come by. And when we did find them, it was very difficult to find them for the whole spectrum of periodontitis disease and also uh, to find consistent estimates across countries. This was especially difficult when it came to dental tariffs, and we had to end up interviewing individual dental practices to get hold of dental tariffs for periodontitis treatment. And therefore, we strongly recommend better availability of dental tariff data to enable, uh, well, to increase the reliability of future studies of this kind. Uh, and that is all for this presentation, but I'm sure there'll be lots of questions that we can, that we can discuss. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Chrissy. I think some really, really, it was a beautifully clear presentation and I think it raises some, some important um, questions. I think perhaps the first observation is the, um, the tremendous differences in, in, in how periodontitis and, and how periodontal care is provided in different countries across Europe, which you flagged. And I think that's really important. Uh, many people across Europe will appreciate that costs are quite significant in countries like Italy and Spain, where it's predominantly privately provided. But equally, as you, as you flagged in France, and, and perhaps to a greater extent in the UK, there is a considerable amount uh, paid out of pocket by the patient. It's a subsidised system, and it's about 30% uh, currently is paid in the UK out of pocket by patients. I think the other thing that's important uh, to note here is that the modelling looked at a whole spectrum of approaches uh, and looked at the extremes. I mean, clearly, we're never going to completely eliminate gingivitis, um, but actually using that as a benchmark uh, gives us an indication as to um, the tremendous impact that patient home care, uh, professionally uh, supported, professionally instructed, but nevertheless patient home care, uh, provides a fantastic opportunity to improve periodontal health uh, with a massive return on investment. And this is something that's come out of previous EFP workshops, actually, uh, the home care message, and, and I think that's fundamental. But I think also surprising, for me at least, was the diagnosis uh, and the management of 90% uh, of periodontitis, also perhaps an extreme scenario, but still delivering a, a positive return on investment. So lots of uh, things to think about. And I would urge that people don't try and grab figures from this because that's not the point. The point is to demonstrate, uh, I think, the range of periodontal uh, care approaches and, and how those uh, effectively affect the economy and, and society at large. So uh, my sincere thanks. Um, 
And um, I, I don't know, uh, Lior is with us, uh, EFP president. Lior, if you would like to make any comments perhaps before we, um, and I'm just dropping this on Lior, this isn't Lior, so you might say, no, I don't want to. Uh, but uh, if you would wish to make any comments, it would be very welcome, Lior, before we uh, open up to Q&A. Yeah. I just want to comment, uh, thank you, Ian, Nicola, and the team from the EIU that did this process. It was a long process. I think it benefit uh, the profession. And uh, I just have to congratulate you to the work and we hope we can circulate it between the right people in the world. <laughs> Thank you, Leo, very much. Um, it was a team effort and I know you were involved and many, many other experts were involved. So uh, thank you to everybody involved. I notice Ken has his hand raised. So if I could just remind everybody before we let Ken speak, um, if you would wish, you wish to answer, uh, to ask a question, please raise your hand. Um, and if I don't identify you, because there's a lot of people on the call, then just speak and uh, we will uh, do our best to, uh, to answer the question. So Ken, please go ahead. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I must congratulate the economist and the EFP on producing this. I think it's very valuable to help raise the profile. But I am very concerned by the data, and it's probably better for me to have a longer chat with perhaps Thomas and Panos about this. But I'm sure everybody will have noticed some very peculiar anomalies there. For example, the astronomical projected costs in Italy did you only interview periodontists in Milan and Rome and perhaps therefore get a very enhanced picture, false picture of fees? Also, the, the prevalence of periodontitis in, six, in 35, 64-year-olds in Spain seems to be incredibly low. Um, and I know from bitter experience that a lot of periodontal uh, epidemiology in the United States historically has been very unreliable. And I think this is a thing we must be very much aware of because there will be people who will try and criticize what's been published on the grounds of some of these data, which are rather weak. I don't want to go on at any greater length. And as I said, I think it might be helpful to speak with uh, Panos about how they accept these, but they are very dubious. Thanks, so, Ken. yeah, I mean, well, I'll let Chrissy and David answer. I, I think, uh, Ken, the point is you have to work with the data you've got. Uh, and as you quite rightly point out, um, there is a very, very limited data set out there. And so this was supplemented with experts from those countries. We also noticed, in particular in Spain, the low levels of um, disease Hello, reported. Hello. And there are explanations for that, which the Spanish were able to provide. But let me pass over to Chrissy and, and David if you want to uh, make any comments on the uh, the modelling. It wasn't just Milan, I can assure you, Ken. <laughs> I can, yeah. I mean, all I can say is that you're not the first person to have highlighted the, the high costs in Italy, nor the low prevalence in Spain. So we have looked over this and tried to figure out reasons for it several times. The Global Burden of Disease reports low prevalence for Spain, and basically we used that as our benchmark for, for this study because it was the, the best piece of evidence that we could get, basically. And in terms of the costs in Italy, I agree, they are significantly high. And if there's one limitation of this whole study, which is what I tried to mention in, at the end of my presentation, it is that we really struggle to get hold of them. Um, sorry, I just muted that person. Sorry to mute you, but it was, there was a bit of a background noise. Um, yeah, we, uh, we really struggled to get hold of tariffs in general, especially in Italy. And we could have interviewed more dental practices to sort of level out that cost, but we didn't have the time within the scale of this study. But it's something that we would really like to improve, perhaps via a survey or something like that in the future. But in general, it was uh, something that we struggled to get hold of. David, I don't know if you've got anything else to say, but I know that you were you agree basically yeah no that was perfectly explained so thank you for that nothing to add to that Kristen. thank you very much um so we have a, a i did see another hand up let me uh, try and find it if you have your hand up just just speak dr linares of course sorry you have your hand up please uh, uh, go yeah. ahead 
Nice to see you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, good, uh, good morning here, Peru. Uh, thanks for your lecture presentation. And, and I would like to know uh, how can uh, periodontists around the world and societies can't uh, make uh, this uh, global position about periodontitis? Uh, I, I have uh, seen the presentation, but how can, could we uh, um, make governments or private uh, industry to, to help uh, inform people about uh, the risk of, of periodontitis and the cost-effective procedures that we must have? I think that's an excellent question, and it's it's something that the FP, uh, in all my years with them, have been pondering. Um, and, and I can honestly say that what we have been doing is chipping away. I, I mentioned the green paper that uh, Maurizio and Soren produced a few years ago. That was an attempt to raise awareness. And there have been various campaigns through the FP, some very effective in trying to raise awareness. I think... Um, from my point of view, it's about sharing this data and sharing this white paper uh, at a national level and trying to um, get engagement as effectively as Ken is with his cat at the moment, um, trying to get engagement from the, um, you know, from the, you know, the public health uh, and the policymakers. It, it, it's, it, it really, really is difficult, Angel, you're absolutely right. Uh, sometimes you meet upon deaf ears. But, but sometimes you can get traction in one country and that can then be used um, in discussions and persuasions to get traction in other countries and you can start to develop some momentum. So we, we just hope this is the start of that momentum uh, developing. I, I don't know, um, uh, Nicola, if you or if Leo want to, want to comment because uh, I, I don't have a huge amount of, to do with the EFP anymore. Uh, I, I step in when I'm asked to to help out and it's always a pleasure. But uh, Yes, I'd like to, to comment on that. I think um, one of our strategic aims is to raise awareness and, and specialisation. Um, and I think this paper is an excellent position paper to go forward. It's a start. It's the first stepping stone. It's great data that we have and we'll use it as well as we can to position ourselves, uh, particularly in, in Europe. Europe to, to increase that level of, of specialization impact at that European big level. Thank you, Leo. Any uh, any thoughts? I can just say something, Ian. Um, yes, please do, Chrissy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the benefits of being the Economist is that we have quite a large platform and influence in sort of the policy and government arena. So you know, we tried to make a big splash with this piece of research. And which is one of the reasons why we went to an extreme with the scenarios. We wanted to really point out the consequences of ignoring, for example, gingivitis or what you could achieve if you aim to treat more patients with perio. And because we know that we can sort of spark conversations with policymakers and governments, that was one of the reasons why we chose to go so extreme with the scenarios. So we continue to sort of uh, promote this research and we've, we've got really good traction on our social media platforms. Uh, and we also want to continue doing research in this area to sort of um, keep the conversation going. That's right. And I think we also need to recognise that some of our um, some of our industry partners, I, I know that PNG and all will be will be using their uh, various uh, social media channels to try and get the message out there as well. Um, and they have obviously a tremendous reach. It's a different type of reach to the economist and a different type of reach to the EFP. Um, I see Thomas Cocker, you have your hand up. Please join us. Nice to see you in your home environment. Thank you, Ian. Isn't it a call for industry to develop toothpastes against the gingivitis? If you look at the carriers arena, there we can see a tremendous success over the last 30, 40 years. And this success came probably mostly by, by the fluoride and the toothpaste. And probably that's the road to go, to go also for Perio. So I think we, usually in, in our profession, we don't tackle very much with toothpastes or mouth rinses. So that's what the industry is doing. And we are just looking what or checking the effects, but we, are, we spend very little time what might be ingredient uh, for, for a toothpaste or for a mouth rinse. 
And I can see the most benefit if we are going in this, or there would be a big benefit if also academia goes in this um, direction and pushes industry or gives industry ideas to, uh, to develop toothpastes. I completely agree, Thomas. Um, I'll come to you in a moment, Peter. Thank you. I can see your hand up. Um, and I think this is something we discussed at the joint workshop between the FB and ORCA. Um, I always joke with the cariologists that they don't have to deal with the immune system. And in perio, we have to deal with the immune system. It's not quite so easy. Um, and we don't have the, the magic bullet like fluoride. But you're right, Thomas, there is um, there are definitely um, ingredients within both mouth rinses and within toothpaste. And the evidence came out in some of the systematic reviews at the prevention workshop and also in the uh, in the treatment guidelines. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right. We need to start thinking uh, more strategically. A classic example would be this message that public health people put out of spit, don't rinse. Well, that's great if you have a caries risk, but, but, but actually, if you have a periodontitis risk, we might want you to rinse with a mouth rinse. And it may well be that we need a different type of regime that you introduce the mouth rinse at a later time point. So the fluoride's retained or you use the fluoride in the mouth rinse. Um, those are just some initial thoughts. Peter, you have a question. Peter Eichholz. Yes, um, if I remember it correctly, the, in the beginning, the, there was uh, um, a figure about 50% of people um, not seeing dentists. Uh, so if this is uh, the case, so how do we reach these people? So uh, uh, thinking about 100% elimination of gingivitis without getting the people uh, to the dentists, then, then I, I support Thomas Kocher's standpoint uh, to have another approach like uh, uh, mouth rinse or um, toothpaste uh, that may work without people seeing dentists because the main problem is then to get people to the dentists. You may raise awareness, but this may be very difficult to, to get the majority of people into the, the dental practices, uh, particularly if um, dental care is not covered by general health insurance. I, th I agree, Peter, and Chrissy made that point really, and she also made the point that, that cost is often a disincentive, the cost of the dental appointment. Um, and that's why, you know, periodontitis is a, is a barometer, if you like, of deprivation, social deprivation. Um, and, you know, we have to look at public health strategies for accessing kids at school, maybe even infants before they go to school. Um, I'd welcome any other comments on, on, on on, on both Peter and Thomas's uh, observations, because I think they are very, very important observations. Ken, you're a public health man. You've been battling the perio, waving the perio flag well, for decades. Yeah, 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 yes, indeed. And I think actually that uh, the WHO resolution on oral health is a big breakthrough because that should help to make people think more about it. Sorry, I'll have to move my cat out of the way. Sorry about that. Um, also, I think we ought to help COVID, use COVID as another lever because the number of people who are dying because of dirty mouths when they get COVID is a very interesting issue. And I think we can, if we can raise this with politicians and the general public, that if you have dirty mouths, it actually can be quite threatening on the systemic side. And if we put all these together in one basket, we ought to be in a stronger position rather than just each one separately. Yeah, the Maruth paper was really quite powerful, wasn't it? And I know yes. that, um, the EIU did look at the periodontal systemic links, um, but it was a little bit beyond the remit of this to start building those in. But they did, in fact, give some narrative uh, in the white paper you'll see on the periodontal systemic links and the, the importance of those. And you're absolutely right with COVID-19, the mouth's a reservoir for the virus. Yeah. And we have mouth rinses out there that kill the virus in vitro. We need the in vivo data, don't we, to come out from some of those RCTs that have been running for some time now to demonstrate it happens in vivo. And if, if we can see that, then uh, I think you're right, that's a very powerful lever. Yeah, I don't okay. know if the IU team want to comment on, on what Ken said there at all. 
Chrissy, any thoughts? Just to back up what you said, Ian, in that, yes, we, we did look at the benefits of integrated dental and general health care pathways in, in, the, in the white paper. And it would be great to see more of that happening at the minute from what we found, it's still very much developing, but would have great benefit in terms of shared risk factors and identifying people at risk of both perio, but also long-term conditions in the future. So yes, I think that's something that is very beneficial and could do with more research behind it, to be honest. Uh, just a couple of comments in the chat. Uh, I'll come to you, Leo, um, but uh, a comment from Oleg about food additives and diet and consumption of, you know, high carb uh, sweets and things, which I think is also an important point. And then Ronaldo's made the point that in Brazil, there are essentially multiple countries uh, because it's essentially a continent and they all have uh, different, uh, uh, different approaches. Um, and so trying to get a single approach to prevention might be quite challenging. Um, Leo, you had your hand raised. Sorry, Leo, you're on, you're on mute. Sorry. I, <laughs> I just want to add to the previous conversation that I think we did in this presentation the first step because I saw... You've gone back on mute. One of the participants in this meeting was uh, Shlomo Vinicker, the uh, Professor Vinicker is the president of Wanka Europe. Wanka Europe is the organization, the biggest organization of Europe of general practitioners. So maybe it's the first step that is interesting and in looking into this uh, problem uh, together with the general health issues. That's interesting. I, you, you went on mute by accident, Leo. So when when you were when you referred to the, the the one of the delegates, which meeting were you talking about there? Because we missed that. Sorry, I just said that I saw the on this presentation the presence of the president of Wanka Europe. Oh, I see. Right. And right. this is a, this is the first step uh, to uh, send the message to the general practitioners in Europe that the periodontitis is part of the general health. Very good point. Thank you. Yeah, Nicola, uh, you had your hand raised. I, I was just going to add, um, I remember uh, people talking about, you know, the chemical toothbrush many years ago and, and how, it, how it could always help. Um, but my point was, I, I was remembering in one of our meetings, you know, um, looking at school children, um, and that would look at sort of from the caries and perio point of view, but really getting that education um, year on year, perhaps in the schools to try and um, help alleviate these conditions and focusing on systemic um, impacts and, and informing at a very young age. Mm, yeah, I agree. I, I've always felt that we ought to be doing it in antenatal classes, that the community mid midwives should be providing basic uh, advice to pregnant mothers uh, at that stage, because, you know, that's the earliest point you can start. And they're very receptive to health information for their unborn children at that point. Um, a comment from Oleg, which I think we all agree with here on uh, the need for a more joined up approach between the different healthcare professionals. I think that is very true. And I think we often underestimate the role of pharmacists who, you know, going back to Peter Eichholz's point uh, and Thomas Cocker's point, people may not be able to afford to visit the dental practice, but some also have anxieties about visiting dental practices, but they regard a pharmacy more of a, a sort of a high street shop type of environment. Uh, and of course, pharmacists are often asked by that large proportion that don't attend a dentist for advice on which toothbrush should they buy uh, and which toothpaste should they use. And I think some education programmes for pharmacists, I know we've delivered it in the past and it's been incredibly well received by the pharmacy community. That, that's something I think we need to start looking at as well. Nicola. I just wondered in if you, I, I believe we have William here um, on the online meeting. And I wondered from an industry point of view, if you wanted to come back and comment um, from his perspective. Yes, it'd be great, uh, it'd be great uh, to hear from William. Um, let me just scroll down and check that he's here with us. Yes, so William, uh, William Minston is with us from P&G and William, bearing in mind the comments made on toothpastes um, and, uh, and toothbrushes by Thomas Cocker and uh, Peter Eichholz, do you have any thoughts you'd like to share with us on that? 
Yes, well, thanks for letting me talk. Um, I would say that I agree that there is an opportunity to drive the awareness uh, among the other professionals when it comes to, let's say, tooth space, for example. Um, I, I do think that there are ingredients that industry provides today that can have benefits for patients developing gingivitis, for example. So I would say I mean, there are ways we can um, educate uh, patients when it comes to at-home at care regimens. Um, and I do think that there are technologies today that uh, can have a significant uh, beneficial impact. And what about the cost, uh, William? Because I, I'm very aware that the more sophisticated toothpaste formulations with the really effective actives in them can be more expensive. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about the range of the offer? Because, you know, there are also cheaper toothpaste that, that are fluoridated. Are there cheaper toothpaste that, that contain similar actives? I'd be interested in your view on that. Yes, and I think that's a very good question. Um, now, of course, the price range is a bit higher for toothpaste that are more advanced uh, because it might cost more to produce them. Yeah. Um, I would still say that for the majority of the population, they are usually quite affordable because it's not like they are very expensive. Uh, but of course, comparing it to a, a regular sodium fluoride toothpaste, you know, you know um, by a private label, you know, then yes, it's, it might, might be twice the price, uh, depending on, you know, the country and, and the different brands. Um, but and I, I think, you know, we, we also have to have a long-term perspective, you know, considering that, yes, the investment of maybe buying a power toothbrush might be quite high for some patients, and that's, that's a given. Um, at the same time, I would say that um, if you go to the dentist and you have to pay for, you know, a quite costly periodontal therapy or, you know, if you have cavities and you need fillings, that might cost you more than investing in a power toothbrush, for example. Uh, and if you look at the, the science today, I mean, there is a very interesting um, uh, published paper that was, well, that came out back in 2019. And I looked at uh, um, more than 3,000 patients over a period of 11 years, um, and they could conclude that after 11 years, the ones using a power brush had 20% more teeth left than the ones using a manual toothbrush. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. I think, and that's you know some of the modeling that David did looked uh, actually at the uh, the direct costs and also the indirect costs. Uh, of, of periodontitis and I, I think for me what was encouraging from this report is it really provides irrespective of the actual figures it provides solid evidence that prevention is cost effective and I've heard in the past from colleagues in the United States that their modeling sometimes questioned whether prevention was cost effective I think it depends on the length of time you're looking over uh, and if you're looking over 10 years uh, and the impact on uh, from a more longitudinal perspective, then uh, it, it's great to see that the return on investment is so is so high. We've got a couple of minutes left, so I think we've probably got time for one more question. If there is another question before we before we wrap up, I'm just trying to see if there are any other hands up. Can't see any other hands up. So, um, any last questions going? going it's like an auction okay so um i think it would be quite good to have some some uh, concluding comments or statements um uh, and perhaps uh, some comments from Julia and then some comments from nicola um and then uh, we will we will um close the uh, the webinar Just uh, I want to thank first the organizers. It's a great idea to have this webinar. Uh, I just want to also uh, to add to what uh, Thomas said. Uh, of course, prevention, we can see clearly 
is the best approach, uh, not only for health issues, but also for economically. So uh, maybe the industry need to, uh, to change the view and uh, try to find something uh, different because they still uh, try to develop uh, products according uh, to maybe all the uh, fashion uh, views regarding periodontitis. All of them are antibacterial and uh, today we know the disease is uh, dysbiosis, not uh, clearly bacterial and they have the part of the immune response. So maybe they need to find something different uh, to put in this uh, toothpaste and mouse rinses that will help uh, combat the disease using the new knowledge that we got in the last 20 years. And I hope it uh, will be done soon. And uh, maybe we'll be able to have the fluoride for periodontitis. Be great to have a fluoride equivalent for Perio, wouldn't it? Thank you, thank you, Leo. Uh, Nicola. Thank you, Ian. Um, well, I think these these are first steps, but for me, they're critical and they're they're really important and they make a huge impact. Um, I think Chrissy said it earlier on. You know, these are our our first first figures, but we can get more. We can drill down into these countries now. We know what we're looking for and the data that's missing and we can um, bolster that information that we've got. I mean, for me, it's really clear that the return on investment is very large, whether it's prevention of gingivitis or return to business, and, and that's critical. Um, these are big sums of money in, in all the countries. So um, this data supports our EFP data, our workshop data, and it's our role now to, to continue to raise awareness and use this really important paper that we have thoroughly enjoyed working uh, with you, Chrissy, and the EIU to produce um, to champion our cause and, 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 uh, and, and have meetings like this and raise awareness. Thank you, Nicola. Yeah. Um, I, well, I'd also say it was an absolute honour to be asked to work with you guys. Um, you know, it was serious hard work, um, but we also had some, some good humour, which is essential. Uh, particularly when, when you're struggling to find bits of information and bits of data. It was an absolute pleasure. You're incredibly professional. Uh, and your independence, I think, was impressive. You were so polite in telling us uh, exactly how it was going to be at the very beginning, and you stuck to it. And, and I think that's really important for the credibility of this piece of work, which, you know, as Nicola has said, it's a, it's, it's a great starting point. I'd like to recognise also Sharon uh, Legendre, who doesn't get much credit, but Sharon was pivotal uh, in all of this, and also Candice, who is quietly controlling us all in the background. Uh, uh, there are strings on my shoulders that are sort of controlling what I'm doing and saying. So thank you, Candice, for the, for the organisation. It's been very smooth. And a final thanks to you guys as delegates. Um, thank you for joining us. We hope it's been useful. Uh, thank you for engaging and for the questions. And um, yeah, let's all power to the EFP and all power to further public influence. Uh, let, let's keep pushing. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Thank you so much.